Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We've been preaching through Ecclesiastes and we've seen what it's like living under the sun. And what Solomon is, is showing is if there was no God, if all it was was the life that we have right now, if all it was was our understanding this is how it would be. And so many things Solomon observes and he sees are not good. And he sees it in many ways as being hopeless. You know, there's many people in life today, uh, many young people uh, in life today. And I, I would say many people in every, every stage, every walk of life that see life as, as hopeless. And I, I think that's why so many people see a need to uh, take away the pain uh, with drugs or with alcohol. They try to numb themselves uh, because they don't see that there's any point to life because they're told that. But uh, the, the conclusion of the matter uh, is that God, He is there, He is real, He is true, and God, He, uh, he is right. Let's look here in verse number 1 and 2, and uh, then we're going to move on to the last verse in the chapter. And so it says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun. Now in the Bible when it says evil, it's not always talking about sin. It just talks about something bad. And uh, it, in the Bible when it, it talks about evil, in this sense it could be referring to like an earthquake or a fire, uh, you know, a, a, a wildfire or uh, a tornado or a, a hurricane. It's e an evil thing. All right. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is, it is common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul, all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power or ability to eat thereof. But a stranger eateth it. He says, this is vanity, and it's an evil disease. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Solomon here is gathering from what he is seeing in life is and he's saying like many people have said and many people say today and maybe you've even thought it life's not fair life's just not fair and he sees this that uh, thing that is common to men is that life is not fair but what he's missing the fact of is that god is always fair and uh, God is always just, and God is always right. And so don't ever uh, confuse the fact of life is sometimes not fair with God is not fair. While life may be, uh, deals people a, a bad hand. Sorry to use that type of uh, illustration, but life may just uh, uh, make it where, you know, something is uh, very hard and very tough for someone. There's still a God, and, and that God, He is always fair. He's always right. He is never wrong, and uh, He is uh, ever-present, and even for us, He is able to... Uh, bring us out of uncertain times. He's able to t carry us through disappointing times. God is able to with, uh, uh, sustain us and withhold us through times of sorrow and of loss. And God, He is there. And uh, Solomon, he makes many other uh, uh, observations in this chapter, which we're not going to look at. Uh, but one thing I want to touch on is in verse number 6. He says, Though he live a thousand years... Twice told, talking about a man. If he live a thousand years twice told, that would be two thousand years. Yet hath he seen no good, do all not uh, go to one place. And uh, that place that he's talking about is the grave. And he's saying if a man were to live two thousand years on his earth, he's still going to die. And uh, that's true. And, uh, you know, uh, Solomon observed that. When it doesn't really matter how much people have. Uh, how much they consume, how much uh, uh, they uh, have seen or done in life, they all go to the same place, and that is the grave. It's not teaching that everyone goes to heaven, and uh, certainly not teaching that everyone goes to hell, but everyone does die. And the Bible's clear about that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now let's look at verse number 11, please. Verse 11 and 12. So seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? 
You know, in Solomon, he asked this question, what is man the better uh, by the things he has, enjoys, consumes? And we, he's seen that in, in certain uh, chapters that we've looked at so far. But I think that's a fair question for us to ask ourselves is, what are we bettered by what we are doing? Uh, what we are adding to our life, what we are, um, what knowledge we are gaining in our life. Is it growing us? Is it bettering us? Is it making us more like Christ? Is it bringing us closer to our, a walk, uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Or, um, you know, are we just stagnant? Uh, you know, adding more things is not always a, a good thing. There's a purpose in, in that. And there's a purpose in, in what we do for God. There's a purpose in what uh, God wants to do with us and the activities that we uh, do in life, the things that we partake in in life, whether it's uh, uh, entertainments or whether it's uh, uh, work or whatever it is that we our hand finds to do. He goes on to say, do it with our might and that we do it heartily as to the Lord, but certainly that it would draw us closer to God. Now verse 12. For who knoweth what is good, uh, what is good for man in this life? And that's a question. Who knoweth what is good for man in this life? And I want to an answer that question by saying, only God. Amen. Only God. Only God knows what is good for man in this life. Only God is, is the one who can really dictate what is good and what is right and what is, is for us. And we ought to we ought to allow God to dictate to us what is good for us. We ought to seek the Lord as what, uh, what He wants us to, to have, what He wants us to know, what He wants us to, uh, to do. Going on, it says, All the days of His vain life, which He spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man... What shall be after him under the sun? And so there's the other question. Who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? And the answer is the same. Only God. Only God can, can tell what will be after you uh, in this life. Only God can tell what you will leave behind. Only God can tell what your legacy may be. Only God knows what is going to be after. And, and for the, really for the, the Christian, for the saved person, it, it is not what we leave behind on this earth that is, is important as much as what we leave behind in heaven. Now, if we are, uh, if we are living for God and we are uh, living for what, what is eternal, the things that are eternal, it is very likely that the things that God allows us to have or build on, on, in this world will also have lasting value will also have value that carries on from generation and generation to generation. And what I'm talking about is lives. I'm talking about souls. I'm talking about people. You know, buildings um, and, and things that, that we make, things that we build with our hands, things that we, uh, you know, produce ourselves that are inanimate or things that uh, are, you know, of this world, they're, they're temporary. And they rust and they fade away, and they crumble, and they fall. But what we need to focus on are things that are eternal, things that are long-lasting. And uh, you know what? Some of those things are, are, are things that only God knows. And we need to seek God as to what those things are that we need to have in our lives. So let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, we just pray that you will open our eyes to the Word of God tonight, and that you'll speak in a, a very profound way through your Word Lord, uh, I don't want to get in the way of anyone uh, hearing and understanding and receiving the message. So, Lord, just pray that you'd help me, uh, Lord, to say the things that you want. And, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, work in our lives, draw us closer to a relationship with Christ, to uh, building the things that are eternal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you allow God to determine what is good for you? Do you allow God to dictate or determine what is good? Or do you say, well, I know what I want in life, and I'm going for it. I know what I want, and that's what I want. That's all that matters. We need to ask ourselves, and we should get in the habit of asking ourselves, what does God want for my life? 
What does God intend for me to have in life? Now, before you think, well, if I seek the Lord, then everything has got to be good. And if I trust God, everything has got to be perfect, and it's got to be wonderful, and there's no bad things at all. But that's not true as well. Uh, just looking back in Genesis, if you want to look at the life of Joseph, from Genesis 37 to chapter 50, uh, almost every one of those chapters covers Joseph in his life. He was uh, the second to the youngest son of Jacob. And he, um, he was envied by his brothers. His father gave him a coat of many colors. And uh, so those of you who know the story, uh, pretend like you're learning something new for the first time. And so I'm just going to run through it. And uh, he was the beloved son of his father and uh, the son of his father's old age. And he was a dreamer. He had dreams given to him by God, but he was hated. He was uh, despised by his elder brothers, despised because his father loved uh, him more than them, despised because his father gave him a coat of many colors, and despised because he had dreams where they bowed down to him, and, uh, and, and they didn't like that. He also uh, incurred disbelief by his parents when he told them about his dreams. They, they didn't believe what he had to say, and, and uh, that, that kind of hurt him uh, on the inside. Uh, but what hurt him even more is he was dragged to Egypt by uh, uh, slaves, uh, slave traders, and he was taken to Egypt as a slave, being sold into slavery by his own brothers and uh, allowing his uh, father to think that he was dead. He uh, was in Egypt as a slave and then falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit while trying to maintain his integrity uh, of his love and his devotion to God and a pure life, and he was thrown into the dungeon. And uh, he was in the dungeon for quite some time, even though God had blessed him. He stayed in the dungeon for a prolonged period of time. But then later on, he was delivered to the throne uh, of Egypt. Uh, and, and it was all in God's time. And by bringing him out and allowing him to interpret the dream of the Pharaoh and thereby save not only his family, but the whole world from the dearth, from the uh, worldwide, I, I guess in that, that place of the world, the worldwide dearth, the famine that would come for uh, a period of seven years and people uh, were without food. And, and at the end of that uh, chapter 50 of Genesis, his, his family comes, they come to Egypt seeking food, and he recognizes them, and it's, a, it's an awesome thing that it, as he tests them and brings them back uh, there and reveals himself to them. But verse number 20, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph said this, after all those things <coughs> that had happened, all of uh, the dungeon, the distrust, the uh, dis his being despised by his brothers, the lost years. Joseph said, But as for you, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as this day to save much people alive. And uh, Joseph, he knew that there was a God in heaven. Joseph knew that God uh, was directing him through all of the twists and turns of life, and, and many of them were not. Good. Many of them uh, were uh, uh, bad and dreary and uh, spending time in a dungeon and being uh, falsely accused and, and uh, being hated and all the things that happened. But he said, God meant it for good. And so God has uh, the ability to determine in our life what is good. We need to align ourselves with what God sees as good. Psalm 73 Verse 28, you, you can turn there or write it down, but I'll read it here. It says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Would you agree with that? Amen. Amen. But you know what? There's things that God might allow us to go through to draw us near to Him. In James, it says, draw nigh unto God, right? And He will draw nigh unto you, but it also says for us to humble ourselves before the Lord. So it may be that God needs to humble us uh, to bring us into the position to draw near to Him. Because if we come to God with a heart of pride, if we come to God with a spirit of pride, 
It says the Lord, he abases those that are proud, but he lifts up those that are humble. And so it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. That's God's purpose in drawing us near to him is that we might declare his works, declare his goodness, declare who he is. In Psalm 119, verse 71, it says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. It is good for me that I have suffered. That's, that's, a, that's a different look at life. Um, that, that's a, a look from the perspective that God has, is that God allows things into our life to uh, make us better. And uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 12, talks about uh, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And so that we should not despise the chastening of God as, as a father loves his son and, and corrects his son, corrects his child. God corrects us. And so we shouldn't despise that. And so God's uh, intent, God's desire is to bring something good uh, to pass in our life. He wants something good for us, but it may be that we have to go through a valley. It may be that we have to go through uh, a, a time of humbling. It may be that we have to go through a time of correction. Now, please turn to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And, and, and so we're going to look here in the New Testament to make application here um, because we live in a New Testament era. We live in a time when uh, the, the, the law of God and all of the plans of God and everything have uh, been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so what does, God, what does that mean for us now uh, to seek what God wants for us in our life? What does it mean for us to seek that good which God has for us? Okay, so Romans 12 verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1, and this whole chapter of, of Romans 12, I could sum it up in saying, live in God's way. And that God wants us to live His way. And if we'll live His way, um, there's, there's a, a whole lot of good that God has reserved for us. Now, on the pathway uh, to that, it may, may, maybe everything isn't good. In, in Romans 8, uh, he gives us the promise that we know that all things work to the, together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. But we can know that uh, in chapter 12, this is God uh, directing us to, um, uh, to do this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, the, uh, the, the mindset of the world, and maybe the mind of, of Solomon as he was writing in Ecclesiastes there, he was saying, you know, uh, my, my body belongs to me. My life belongs to me. I worked hard for, uh, you know, years and years, and that's why he says it's an evil thing, and it's something common among men that, that a man would, uh, that God would give a man all of these things, but he wouldn't get to enjoy it. And it goes through that, that worldly mind of thinking that my life is my own. The worldly mind of thinking that my body is my own and, and, and the things that I have are really my own and they're not. You know, what, what our life is and what our life consists of as a, a Christian, as a child of God, it's not our own. Because Jesus paid the price for us all. And, uh, and so here he says that we should present or consecrate. We should come to a place of consecration in giving our body, our life to the Lord as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto God. A, a life that is holy unto the Lord. He says, be holy for I am holy. And so God, He wants, he wants our life, but He doesn't take it. He prompts us to give it. He prompts us to give, give Him uh, our life. And if Jesus gave us His life, and He died for us, is there anything too great for us to give Him? I, I believe not. I, there's nothing too great. And so it's, it's a reasonable thing for us to do. It's a reasonable uh, offering that we would give our body, our life, unto Him, because He is worthy. 
In verse number two, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when we ask the question, what does God want for my life? Number one, God wants consecration. That means that, that God wants us to, to give us or give ourselves unto Him. And then He also wants transformation. Because you know what? God really, He can't, He won't. And He can't use this flesh. Okay? This, I mean, this, what I'm talking about is uh, our, our, we, have, we have to live in this flesh. Okay? The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So we have to live in the flesh. But what I'm saying is He can't use us if we're operating in the power of our flesh. And uh, we, you know, we're going to go on in the, in the chapter to see that, is that God does not receive glory when we live in the power of our might or in the power of our flesh. And that's why it said in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's not our strength, it's not our power that we serve Him in. So consecration, transformation. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. And then verse number three, for I say through the, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. This is, this is an interesting way that Paul says this. He says the grace given unto me, it's like I've already had to learn this myself. And so it was a gift. And in Philippians chapter three Paul lets us know kind of about how this is. And then also, I think it's over in 1 first, first Corinthians, where Paul, he had all these things that he could have boasted about. Okay? And he, he was a, a Jew, and he was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he was a Pharisee, and he knew the Scriptures, and he was zealous of the Jews' religion, and he persecuted uh, the church, and he did all of those things. Um, but it was, and then later on after he saw, I mean, he saw a vision of Jesus Christ, he was saved and the Lord used him greatly and uh, all, of, all of those ways. What he said is, is that God had to humble him. And, and God actually allowed him to have a thorn in his flesh. And he prayed and said, God, take this thorn away from me. He prayed three times. And God said, no, I'm not taking it away. And he said, you're better with it than without it. And so um, I, th I thought that was interesting the way he would say, for I say through the grace given unto me. Paul saw that humiliation was a gift. And, uh, you know, uh, Frank, he's not here tonight, but we we're talking about that. He, he, would say, he would say humiliation. And I'd say, no, it's humility. God wants to give us humility. But I think just to keep the alliteration here, consecration and transformation, God wants to give us humiliation. <laughs> and uh, God's not wanting to humiliate us, but God's wanting us to be humble. And God's wanting us to learn humility. But it's not a curse. It's a gift. Verse 3, it says, the, the grace given unto me, it's a gift for God to humble us so that we would not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. If we're thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, God, God can't use us. God's not going to use us. And so here it says, uh, but according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Notice the word measure here. Uh, the word in the original language is talking about volume or extent, like a length of measure, and it's actually the, the, the word, uh, they, they get the word meter from, all right? Meter, and uh, like a length of measurement, meter, or even like uh, tick-tock, tick-tock, meter, all right? And so anyway, it's talking about volume or extent. And so we, it, it, here he talks about now how we can serve God. Okay, so if we have consecrated ourselves to the Lord, and we've asked ourselves, God, uh, what is, what is that good thing that you want for me in my life? What is that that you want to perform in my life? So we start off with consecration and, and, and allowing God to transform us and then humbling ourselves, humility. Then, then the Lord wants us to serve Him. And, and, you know, God wants us all to serve Him. And He says here in chapter 12, 
uh, about we have as, uh, as we have many members in one body. You know what body he's talking about here? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the body of Christ. And that is where God wants us to serve him. God is wanting us to uh, not only be consecrated, saved, surrendered to the Lord, uh, transformed by his power and his word, and be humble, but God wants us to be serving him. And, uh, and, and so we do so uh, through faith. And it says, uh, uh, many members in one body, all members here it says have not the same office. And he talks about several areas of service. But I want to go on verse number five. It says, for, for we are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Working together is what he's talking about. And uh, verse 6, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, talks about prophecy. And uh, here that it's not talking about making prof prophecies, but actually preaching and uh, preaching the word that has already been delivered. And uh, I, here in verse 6, it says, according to the proportion of of faith. And so that's how, that's how we know it's not talking about coming up with something new, but it's talking about delivering something that's already been given because the proportion of faith, that word is where we get uh, analog from. And uh, you guys know what an analog clock is? <laughs> okay, the older ones, right? Okay, it's the round clock that has the numbers going around and uh, uh, it comes from two words, Anna meaning in the middle, all right, and log meaning, you know, the, the, the words, the numbers. And so the, the numbers going around the middle. And, uh, and so the word of God is what we preach. And we stay, on the, we stay on the middle point. We stay true to what the message of the word of God is and preaching. And that's what it's speaking of there. The proportion of faith or the main or middle word in the word of God and uh, bringing forth that. Verse 7 talking about ministry or serving. Verse number uh, 7 also talking about teaching. Verse 8 exhorting, talking about encouraging one another. That's a, a gift that God gives. Uh, uh, verse number 8 also talks about giving, uh, like extra grace of giving uh, uh, unto the Lord, unto uh, the church, unto others in many different ways. Uh, also in verse number 8 talks about ruling or organizing, uh, being diligent in that. Talks about mercy in verse number 8 again, uh, a spiritual gift of mercy and being uh, cheerful in that. Verse number 9 speaking about love and having love. And all of those things that we could really expound on and uh, hone in on every single one of those gifts that, uh, that God wants to bring out through every Christian, every saved person, at least has one of those gifts that God wants to bring out in our life. And not one, not one Christian has every one of those gifts. And it's not just a pastor that has those gifts. It's every believer God gives. And he brings us to a place in our life and to a, a place in life, the church, together where we can use those gifts and where we can uh, uh, make them useful unto the Lord and for each other to, to build one another up. But it starts off with consecration and transformation and, and humility or humiliation as we see there. And so uh, what, we, what we see is living God's way starts off with asking, what does God want for my life? And I think we ought to do that. We ought to ask, God, what do you want for, uh, for my life? And uh, here in chapter number 12, it, it gives more uh, instruction on really how to use these uh, different gifts uh, in business, in verse number 11, talks about serving the Lord, talks about distributing to the necessity of saints, just trying to meet needs of people, hospitality, going through life, even when people persecute you, blessing them, being a real Christian all the time, and having the mind of Christ. And having the right, um, the, the right focus. Verse number 16, it says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, 
but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And so God, he wants us again to have that same mind directed toward him and uh, living for him, living God's way. So let's go back to that thought in Ecclesiastes 6 in verse number 12, where he says, who knoweth? Who knoweth? And he's talking about, uh, I believe he's talking about God is, is, the, is the right answer for that. Who knoweth the ways of man? Who knoweth uh, what is good for man? And uh, then at the end, he asks uh, that question, who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? What shall be after him? Talking about living for eternity. And so I think uh, the Apostle Paul was uh, a man who was living for eternity. And we don't need to just look at the Apostle Paul and say, well, he was a man living for eternity, but I don't think we can do that. No. Uh, in fact, we're, we're admonished to follow him as he followed Christ. He wrote that to uh, believers there in uh, one of the churches, said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I, said, I think we can follow that same example of living for eternity. Look at Philippians 2, verse number 13. Philippians 2, 13. It says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God which worketh in you. Now, it, it's God who begins the work in you, right? The work of salvation it wasn't you. It wasn't me. Uh, you know, baptism isn't what saved us. You know, uh, turning over a, a new leaf didn't save us. We don't have any leaves out here anyway. You can't turn over a new leaf. Okay? It, it, was, it wasn't me starting to come to church or, or me being nice to people. It was God which worketh in me. The Lord Jesus Christ which came into uh, my heart by faith because of his sacrifice, because of his shed blood, because of his resurrection. And so it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so is it, is it our desire, is it your desire for God to work within you? Is it your desire for God to do of his good pleasure in your life? If it's not, we're living for ourselves. If it's not, we're following after our plan. If it's not, we're living to please ourselves. We need to live for God's pleasure. We need to live in a way where we are seeking to please God and, and uh, live for, for Him. Philippians 2, verse 16. Philippians 2, 16 says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. And that day of Christ is speaking of the resurrection, the day when Jesus Christ will come in the clouds and call every believer, those who have died and those who are alive and remain, up into the clouds to be with Him. That's called the rapture. That's called the resurrection of the saints. And on that day, we'll meet Him in the air. On that day, we'll be ushered into glory with Him. And uh, there's uh, going to be many things that take place at that time in heaven. While on the earth, there's going to be tribulation. In heaven, there's going to be a marriage supper. In heaven, there's going to be a, a, a judgment seat of Christ. Not a judgment for sin, but a reward for saints. A reward for those who have served the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we look for. The day of Christ, that I may rejoice and know that I didn't run in vain. I, I didn't live this life in vain. I didn't just spin my wheels. Anybody like getting stuck in the mud? I don't. I've been stuck probably more than anybody out here. And I haven't lived out here that long. I've been stuck in buses. I've been stuck in four-wheelers. I've been stuck in four-wheel drives, two-wheel drives, whatever wheel drives. I've been stuck in everything imaginable. I don't like being stuck. And I don't want to be stuck in my Christian life either. Amen. Amen? But you know what? If we're living for the flesh, if we're living for the world, we're stuck. We're just spinning our wheels. I don't want to run in vain, 
I don't want to labor in vain. I don't want to live in vain. And neither should you. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. Philippians 3, 13. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. You know what? Paul, he's saying right here, I, I haven't grasped everything yet. I haven't apprehended it totally. I don't have it all together. We don't have it all together. No. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Amen? We can forget those things which are behind. When we have confessed and forsaken sin, isn't it wonderful? It's under the blood. Amen. We don't have to go dig it up. God's not going to dig it up. God's not going to go bring our sins, bring us sins of our past upon us and hold them over our head. Thank God. He's not going to do that. So we can forget those things which are behind. <laughs> <laughs> in reaching forth unto those things which are before. <clears throat> before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There he uses a, another, another term of, of running, all right, pressing for the mark, leaning in for the goal, and uh, giving it everything he had. Giving everything he had. On the finish line. And that's what uh, Philippians uh, was toward the end of his life. He was in prison. He was going to be, you know, he, was gonna, he knew he was going to be a martyr for Christ. He was going to die. And he didn't say, oh, it's me. It's hard. It's tough. I don't know what I'm going to do. He didn't do that. He said, I'm going to press toward the mark. And I'm going to give it everything I've got. You know what? That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to give Him everything we have right now because we don't know when He's coming back. And you know what? Another thing is we don't know when He's going to call us out. And He could be calling us out with a trumpet or He could be calling us out through the grave. I, I don't know what's going to come first and neither do you. I want to be ready. I want to finish strong. Colossians chapter 3, Colossians, Philippians, Colossians, and then this, this is the last, uh, last place we're going to look at. And uh, verse number 1, Colossians 3, 1 um, through 4 says, if ye didn't be risen with Christ. That's talking about saved risen with Christ by the power of His resurrection. You're living in His resurrection power. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You say, I can't do that. I can't do that. Well, if we, if we will get the right focus, if we'll get the right view of what's important, with God's help, it's possible. Okay? It's possible. Our affections. Verse 3, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, that's a different perspective. You say, you're dead. If I said, Tony, you're dead. <laughs> it's not like, you're dead meat. No. <laughs> You say, no, I'm not. I'm right here. I'm breathing. I'm living. Okay. Well, what he's talking about is, is what our life is. In perspective, in perspective, if we're living for the things of the flesh, we're living for dead things. If we're living for the things of this world and we're living for the things of, of the flesh, we're living for dead things. But God doesn't want us to live for dead things. He wants us to live for eternal things. Right. Things that are alive, and alive forevermore. And he says, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, again referencing his, his second coming, the rapture, uh, you shall also appear with him in glory at the resurrection. And so he gives some instructions here um, of what we should do to help us 
what we can do to help us to set our affection on the things that are above, okay? Number five, verse number five says, mortify therefore your members. All right, mortify means to kill. And uh, Jesus, he said, if your eye offend you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. If your foot offends you, cut it off. It's better to enter into life, okay, halt or blind or with one hand than to go to hell fire. Now, here, I don't believe it's talking about that particularly, okay? But what it is telling us here is that our flesh is going to the grave. And so it's as good as dead, okay? And every day we live, I mean, it may, be the, it may be that you woke up this morning and you just sprung out of bed and you felt alive and you're like, wow, this is such a great day, you know? But you might have got out of bed this morning and you're like me and you're like, oh, <laughs> and you're, you're going to the bathroom. <laughs> you're like, ow, oh, everything hurts and you feel like death. And that's what's happening every day. We're dying. Every single day, we're getting closer to death. And you, you may not want to hear that, okay? All right? And I don't know who's going to... I might win that race. I might go before everybody else in here. Who knows? Okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that, that that's the direction we're headed. And uh, Solomon said that. Uh, we already looked at that verse there. Everybody goes to the same place. But here he's talking about mortifying our members that are holding us back. He's talking about if we're living for the things of our hands, you know, the things that our hands can touch and, and feel and do, we're living for dead things. If we're living for things that our, only our eyes can see, only our eyes can enjoy, we're living for dead things. If we're, we're only living for the things that our legs and our feet can do and enjoy in this life, we're living for dead things. What he's saying is if we're living in a way that is just, just feeding our flesh and glorifying our flesh and maybe even sinful, okay? So it could be not or sinful. He's saying, you know what? It'd be best to cut it off because God's not glorified and it's not going to bring us to the place where God wants us to be. And so here he's talking about sin in particular. Verse 5, Mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, Inordinate, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. First three are talking about sexual sin. It's very clear what he's talking about. He's talking about anything that is not aligned with God's plan of marriage. One man, one woman for one wife joined together in matrimony. Okay, And, and that's what he's talking about here. Um, evil concupiscence has to do with the, our, our, eye, our eyes and our mind and our thoughts. Um, covetousness, of course, things that, that we want and desire. Uh, going down to verse number um, 9, uh, sorry, verse number 8, he says, Now put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not one to another. He's saying, put off these things. Put off these deeds of the flesh. Put off these things that a Christian ought not be doing. Now, you know what? You can't tack Christian onto any one of those things. You know, it's, it's popular today for people to say, well, we have Christian this and Christian that. You know, there's Christian rock. There's Christian rap. There's Christian... I, I don't know what people are putting Christian on, but... I mean, can you do that? Christian fornication, Christian, uh, let's look down, Christian anger, Christian wrath, Christian murder, Christian cussing, Christian uh, uh, uncleanness. Uh, you can't. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't fit. And so God, he says for us to put that off. God says, get it out of our life because we're, we're not going to reach the, the goal, the place that God wants us to, and we're not going to be able to serve him if we don't put it off. And then uh, last of all, verse number 10, verse number 10, he says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God. And here's where he, he puts some positive. Anytime we get rid of something negative, anytime we get rid of something negative in our life, we've got to replace it with something positive. Amen? 
A person who's addicted to alcohol, a person who's addicted to drugs, they're addicted to something that is, is destroying their life, you know, they need to replace that thing. Get rid of it, but replace that thing with something good. Replace it with something right. Replace it with something holy. Replace it with something positive and godly. And so he says, put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Let the peace of God rule into your hearts, which also ye are called in one body. And you know what? We, we started talking about that in Romans, about that body and how we can serve the Lord and how we can live for God. You know, we really can't serve God right. We really can't live for God right until we allow God to prune us back. I'll start cutting this plant, pruning it back. It wouldn't do any good because this plant's it's not ever going to die and it's not ever going to get any bigger. It's, it's dead, all right? So, uh, but, you know, that's what God does. He prunes us back and He cuts things off that aren't good and he, take, he, he wants us to get rid of things that are not good in our life, namely sin, namely sin. And He says, let peace of God rule in our heart. Be thankful. Let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another and he just keeps going on, things that God uh, wants in our lives, areas in our life that God, he can keep uh, reaching into and working on us. And it's not, all, it's not all at one time, you know. It's not like God opens uh, the floodgates you know, and we have to drink out of a fire hose. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that, you know. It's like, oh, wow, this is uh, too much, too much. But God, he... He wants us to, to receive that water of life. And uh, that water of life, the Word of God, and, and uh, His good plan, His goodness for us is good. Amen. And it makes a difference. And it does so much. What it does is it allows us, like Jesus said, when the Spirit of God comes into us and we, we allow God to rule in our hearts. We allow the Spirit of God to fill us and, and dictate to us what we should or should not do. He says, out of your belly shall flow ri rivers of living water. See, that's a weird thing to say. What he's saying is out of your life, out of your soul, is going to flow living water to others. You know what? God wants life to be flowing out of out of us. Amen? God wants life to be flowing out of us. And you know what? The one, most wonderful thing is that, is that God can use you Amen. and me. That's an amazing thing. That's like even more amazing that God would use me. But here's another thing. He wants to. <laughs> he wants to. He wants to use us. He can use us. He wants to use us. And if we allow Him he will use us. If we allow him, he will. So that's the message.